Welcome to this continuing discussion of the ISLM model, where our goal is going to be after a thorough discussion of the IS relationship in previous videos and a thorough discussion of the LM relationship in previous videos, we want to finally put these two together. And uh, specifically, we're going to do that on a graph. And whenever you see a graph in economics, you know what's coming next. It's going to be comparative statics. So we'll draw a diagram. In fact, we've already done it. We see uh, below where we have both IS and LM together. And I've labeled the point A, which represents our, our uh, determined real interest rate and level of output based on IS and LM put together. And the question we want to ask is, suppose something happened, something that might shift the IS curve or shift the LM curve, or maybe stuff happens in both shifts. Um, can we diagram that up, sort of figure out what happens, make predictions about what happens to our two key endogenous variables, the real interest rate and real GDP? So let's go ahead and try that out. We have a scenario uh, written up at the top. We're told that government spending increases and we're asked what happens, specifically what happens on the diagram, what happens to R and Y. And I've listed some steps on the right. They probably look familiar because they're pretty similar to the steps we used when thinking about IS or LM individually. Um, the first step is we want to look at the event, government spending increasing, and say, is this about IS? Is it about investment and savings? Or is it about LM, about liquidity and money? Theoretically, it could be about both. It could shift both curves, but usually it'll be one or the other. So let's ask ourselves, if government spending increases, does that have something to do with investment or savings in the loanable funds market? And hopefully you're shaking your head and saying, yes, definitely, government spending is a big part of public savings, so we know this is going to affect savings, so we should be expecting uh, the IS curve to be affected. So I'll circle that. And then hopefully you also said, if we asked, does this does government spending have anything to do with the money supply or money demand? And you said, no, not really, so we don't need to think about uh, LM. All right, so that's step one. This is about IS. This is going to shift the IS curve one way or the other. Now we need to do step two, figure out uh, which way is it going to shift. Is it going to push interest rates up and shift that IS curve upward, or is it going to push interest rates down and shift that IS curve downward? And our standard method for doing this that we've seen in previous discussions is to draw a loanable funds diagram. And after you've done this enough, you, you might be able to do this in your head. But for the first couple of problems, we're going to try to stick to drawing these diagrams out and getting a lot of practice. So we'll draw in our initial level of saving and investment and some initial interest rate. And now we could imagine different levels of income would sort of give us all these different equilibrium points, and that traces out our initial IS curve that we've we've drawn out. But then the question becomes, if government's uh, spending increases, what would happen? Well, it would affect public savings. Specifically, remember, public saving is T minus G, so it would decrease public saving. If you're doing a lot of spending, you don't save much, so public spending uh, saving decreases. So that would shift S this way. So you'd have some new S, and then we'd get a new equilibrium in the loanable funds market. In fact, what we really get is a whole new set of equilibrium points. For different levels of income, there would be different equilibrium points, and that'll give us a new IS curve. And the crucial question is, is it going to give us a new IS curve with higher interest rates or with lower interest rates? And this is where the diagram is really helpful for answering step two. Clearly, when we look at A versus B, um, the interest rate is much higher at B, so it's going to shift interest rates up, meaning we're going to shift that IS curve. We're going to push that IS curve upward. So our new IS curve would look something like this. And then we get our new equilibrium B. And we can see that our conclusion is that comparing A to B on our ISLM diagram, the interest rate is higher, so R was pushed up, and our output Y was higher, so Y was pushed up and this sort of fits with our intuition. If we go back to the Keynesian cross model, for instance, it didn't say anything about interest rates. Interest rates weren't part of that model, but um, it did make a strong prediction that if you increase government spending, you're going to increase output in the short run. And it's good to see that our ISLM model is consistent with that. It would be um, it, it would be troubling if our different models gave us very different predictions about how government spending impacts output in the short run, because then we'd have to try to decide, well, which model's better? Which one do we uh, trust more? All right, so let's continue with this process of doing comparative statics. We'll just walk through a couple more uh, scenarios. The next scenario is going to be, suppose that 
for some reason that we don't really need to specify, let's just imagine, for some reason people wake up one day and they don't want to hold as much money. They decide, I really don't need as much money in the bank. I'm going to take some money out of the bank and buy bonds instead or do something else with my wealth, wealth and um, how will this impact the economy in the short run? So we've got our initial ISLM diagram set up. We have our initial equilibrium point A, and now we need to follow our two-step process. First, is this going to affect IS? Uh, so does lower money demand have anything to do with investment or saving? And I think probably we all agree, no, it has nothing to do with investment. It has nothing to do with savings. This is definitely a LM thing. This is about money, right? It's, it's in the s short description of the scenario. This is about money demand. So this is about LM. So for step one, we'll draw in our uh, liquidity preference diagram. We've got our money demand labeled L. We've got our real money supply MP. Uh, together they determine the interest rate, and so we have some, some initial equilibrium point. Maybe we'll call this number one. And now step two is that we have to figure out, based on this scenario, something changing. Is this going to push the interest rate up or down in the diagram? And that'll tell us how to shift our LM curve. Well. We can just draw it out. Money demand is decreasing. People don't want to hold as much money for some unspecified reason. That shifts us to point, I'll label it 2, and we can see that clearly this is pushing interest rates down. Uh, and because of that, then the LM curve will push the whole LM curve down. And this is the one point where you where things can get a little confusing, because when I say down, I mean like lower interest rates, right? So I mean physically uh, down like this. You might get tripped up. Sometimes people get tripped up because they look at the LM curve and it looks sort of like a supply curve. It slopes up like a supply curve. It's not actually a supply curve, but it sort of looks like it. Uh, and you're probably so used to working with supply that when you hear supply went down, you think, oh, that means pull supply to the left, which is pulling it physically uh, upward. So you might hear LM push LM down, and then you, you might sort of accidentally actually push it up. Try to avoid that mistake. Try to take these um, these steps about interest rates going up or down literally, and make sure that when, that when you draw in that new LM curve, you push it downward. You see that the interest rate is pushed downward, um, and we see that here at point B, right? From A to B, the interest rate was pushed downward, and our output was pushed um, upward. And then you might say, how could I, you know, verify that this makes intuitive sense? Well, the, the interest rate part, we can just sort of see all the diagrams are consistent. But what about the output part? I don't really have any intuition. Uh, um, you know, probably most people wouldn't have any intuition about how does money demand affect output in the short run. But I think in this example, a good way to think about it would be you'd probably expect lower money demand to affect the economy quite similarly to how a higher money supply would affect the economy. Because a lot of the time in you know supply and demand models, less supply leads to higher prices, more demand leads to higher prices, more supply leads to lower prices, less demand leads to lower prices. So often, you know, in some sort of qualitative sense, less demand for money should be quite similar to more supply of money. And we know more supply of money leads to an a increase in output and a decrease in interest rates. That's one of the, the Fed's main tools for managing the economy in the short run. So in that sense, our, our overall conclusion here makes uh, some sense. So hopefully that makes some intuitive sense for you. Let's go ahead and do one more scenario. And uh, this last scenario is sort of more like a, you know, it's, it's something that's hard to capture in terms of specific quantitative modeling, but it's definitely something most economists think is important for the economy in the short run. And it's this notion of business confidence. So the scenario is that firms have higher business confidence. We don't really know why. I mean, it's just a gut feeling they sort of wake up with, and um, they feel really good about the economy. And because of that, what we're really saying is that they want to invest more. They feel like people are going to want to buy their products. They feel optimistic about the future of their business. So they want to build more factories. They want to expand their computer networks, do more research and development. Uh, who, who really knows, right? But this all adds up to more investment. So our initial equilibrium on the diagram is here at point A. We've drawn that initial ISLM diagram several times now, so we're really good at that step. Then we turn to, is this about IS or LM? Is it about investment savings? That's IS, and I think everyone's nodding their head and saying, yes, definitely. Uh, it sort of says it right here, right? Firms want to invest more, so there's going to be more investment. This is about IS. Uh, and on the other hand, um, is it about LM? Well, it's usually if it's about IS, it's not going to be about LM. But just for thoroughness, we could ask that. And then we'd say, no, investment has nothing to do with um, the, the liquidity preference. That's about money supply, money demand, things like that. 
All right, fantastic. So we know this is about IS, so we should draw in our loanable funds model to sort of guide our thinking. We have our savings curve. We have our investment demand curve. We have that determining the interest rate. We'll label this like point number uh, one. You'll notice on all the different scenarios, I labeled these, you know, one, one in Roman uh, numerals. I labeled it A. It doesn't really matter what you label them as long as you know this one came first, that one came later. If you don't label them this something to indicate this came first, then that came later. Then someone might look at your diagram and not really be able to tell, and that would be bad. Uh, so, so labeling, sp the specific way you do it's not super important, but the fact that you do it is really important. All right, so that's our in initial scenario in the loanable funds market. Then we're told businesses want to invest more, so that must mean shifting I upward. We have more interest in investment, demand, and that gets us to this new point that I'll label two. And at that new point, we can answer step two. This is definitely higher interest rates. It's pushing interest rates up. And that means I need to push my IS curve up, right? Physically push it upward. So to, to, to give us higher interest rates for any given level of income. And when I do that, I have my diagram like this. And I get my equilibrium point B. So comparing A and B, our conclusion is that if firms want to invest more, that's going to push interest rates up and it's going to push output up. And that probably is not too intuitively surprising. You would think that if everybody wants to invest, they're all going to rush to try to get a loan at the same time. Banks are going to then be able to charge them higher interest since everyone's competing to get a loan. At the same time, with all this investment, that's going to increase total expenditure, and that's what output or GDP measures. It measures output slash expenditure slash income, so it makes sense that the economy would be booming when businesses are confident. Hopefully these three scenarios all made sense for you. There's certainly a lot more scenarios that we expect you to be able to handle after grasping this model and really understanding this model. So the important thing I want you to take away from this video is this two-step, it's really more than two steps, but two key step process of we set up the initial ISLM diagram, then we ask ourselves about the scenario, is this about investment savings, IS, or is this about liquidity money? Usually it's one or the other. Based on that, we draw our diagram and we figure out, is this going to push interest rates up or down? And based on that, we shift the IS curve or the LM curve as appropriate, remembering to push it either up for higher interest rates or down for lower interest rates and avoid the confusion with left or right because uh, that's uh, a little bit less intuitive. Thanks for watching.